Model evaluation is not just about showing how well your model works, it's also about working out what it means to get a certain performance, and more importantly, what it doesn't mean. In this video, we will use the following research as a running example. In 2017, researchers from Stanford built a classifier that predicted sexual orientation, restricted here to the classes heterosexual and gay, from profile images taken from a dating site. They reported 91% ROC area under the curve on men and 83% on women. The results were immediately cited as evidence of a biological link between biology and sexual orientation. The following important caveats were largely overlooked in media reports. Some of the performance came from facial landmarks, but some came from superficial details, like hairstyle, lighting and grooming. The results were only true when averaged over a large population. It's true that women live longer than men on average, but that doesn't mean that there are no old men. Likewise, likewise the phase that you can guess orientation based on, say, the length of your nose, with better than chance accuracy, may only be due to a very small difference between the two distributions with plenty of overlap. And finally, getting close to 90% AUC may sound impressive, but it basically means, but it essentially means that you will make one ranking error for every 10 attempts, so this is still a very crude classifier. The study authors make many of these points themselves, both in the original paper and in a Google document published afterwards, linked in the slide PDF, but that didn't stop the paper from being wildly misrepresented. Like we did previously, we'll look at some important questions to ask yourself when you come up against a topic like this. We'll ask the same questions we asked the last time, and a number of new ones. First, the matter of considering history. In this case, there's a long history of science claiming to be able to divine personal attributes, most often criminality, from the structure of a subject's face. This is called physiognomy, and almost any claim made in this field has been conclusively proven to be false, and usually to be based on poor scientific practice and spurious correlations. That doesn't mean, of course, that the entire idea of physiognomy is conclusively disproven, but it does mean that when we are stumbling into the same area with new tools, we should be aware of the mistakes made in the past so that we can be careful not to repeat them. A question we asked in the first lecture is relevant here as well. Are we looking at what we think we're looking at? To investigate this issue more closely, here is a visualization of a classifier looking at a chest x-ray and making a prediction of whether the patient has cardiomegaly, that is, an enlarged heart. The heat map on the left indicates regions the heat map on the left indicate regions that are important for the current classification. The largest values are near the heart, which is what we expect. However, the classifier is also getting a positive contribution, and in particular, from the portable label in the top right corner and from the marker on the right. These indicate that the x-ray was taken with a portable scanner, and such scanners are only used when a patient's condition has progressed so far that they can't leave their house. In such cases, it's a safe bet that they have cardiomegaly, but that's not what we want a classifier like this to look at. These kinds of problems are often called clever Hans effect. Clever Hans, or der kluge Hans, was an early 20th century German horse who appeared to be able to do arithmetic. As it turned out, Hans was not doing arithmetic. He was reading the body language of his handler. He was reading the body language of his handler to see whether he was moving towards the right answer. This is impressive in itself, of course, but it does mean that Hans didn't show the kind of intelligence that was being attributed to him. Crucially, this was not a hoax. The handler truly believed that Hans was able to do arithmetic and had no idea that he was guiding him subconsciously. This, incidentally, is also why double-blind experiments are so important in other fields. For us, Hans serves as a powerful reminder that just because we're seeing the performance we were hoping for doesn't mean we're seeing it for the reasons we were hoping for as well. A related question you should ask when you find that you can successfully predict x from y is which causes which. This image shows a feature that researchers found when attempting to predict criminality based on a data set of faces of criminals and non-criminals. One of their findings is that the angle made by the corners of the mouth and the tip of the nose is a highly predictive feature. The authors suggest that such facial features are indicative of criminality. However, when we look at the data set, that it's not the features of the face so much as the expression that differs. In the non-criminal photographs, the subjects hold a light smile, as is common, whereas in the criminal set, the expressions have a more explicitly relaxed jaw. 
what we're seeing here are not facial features so much as facial expressions. This is important because it changes the interpretation of the results completely. The physiognomical interpretation is that there is a biological mechanism that causes both criminality and a particular whiteness of the mouth, and that this is determined at birth. And the alternative explanation is that when people with a criminal background have their photographs taken, they are more likely to prefer a menacing expression than the average person is. Note, incidentally, that the photos of criminals are not mugshots. They are described as normal ID photos by the authors. Let's go back to the sexuality classifier. What might a clever Hans effect look like here? In the most extreme case, you might expect a classifier to just look at the background of the image. The authors were more careful here than you might expect. The background of the image was blurred and the facial features, the eyes, the nose and the mouth, were detected and aligned. The focus of the classifier was investigated with saliency maps, indicators of where the model is looking. This is a fallible method, but it does show a general focus on the face. And a second classifier was trained, which was fed only facial landmark data. The position of the eyes, the roundness of the jaw, and so on. The suggestion here being that this prevents a majority of the clever Hans effects that you might see. And finally, the deep neural network used to extract features from these pixels was not actually trained on this data, but on another facial data set. Only its features were fed to a shallow classifier that then learned from these labels. This severely limits the ability of the classifier to pick up on surface details. Another question we suggested in the last video is whether the target label you've chosen is saying what you think it's saying. In this case, the authors inferred sexuality from the stated preference in the dating profile. This is clearly correlated with sexuality but it's not quite the same thing. Firstly, sexuality is one of those attributes, like movie genres, that can only be crudely approximated by a set of finite categories. Moreover, for many people, it's not a fixed attribute, and it is subject to some evolution throughout their life. The stated preference on a dating profile also means that you're only capturing those gay people who are willing to live relatively openly as gay. This may be highly dependent on social background, it's certainly conceivable. It's certainly conceivable that in poorer subcultures, people are less likely to come out as gay, either to their community or to themselves. This means that what we're detecting when we're classifying a face in this data set as gay is more likely a combination of factors that are a correlation to that label. One good way to help us make sense of this is to come up with different hypotheses that explain the observed effect. The authors observe that in their data set, the heterosexual men are more likely to have facial hair. That's most likely a grooming choice based on the differences in gay and heterosexual subcultures. For other correlations, such as that between sexuality and nose length, the authors suggest the prenatal hormone theory, a theory that relates prenatal hormone levels in the mother with the sexuality of the subject. In short, a biological mechanism that is responsible for both the slight variation in facial features and the variation in sexual orientation. But that's not the only possibility. In the previous slide, but that's not the only possibility. We've already seen that it's difficult to separate facial features from facial expressions. However, even if we somehow eliminate the expression, that doesn't mean that every facial feature we see is determined at birth. For instance, the roundness of the jaw is also influenced by body weight, which is strongly influenced by social class. For instance, whether somebody grows up poor or rich. And while there's no evidence that social class influences the and while there's no evidence that social class influences the probability of being gay, it most likely does influence how likely a gay person is to end up setting up a dating profile. So that hypothesis would look like this. Note that all of these are purely hypotheses intended to show which kinds of causalities might cause these correlations, and I'm not in the least bit qualified to say which is more likely to be true, but it's important to go through the exercise of coming up with these hypotheses to show to yourself what your experiment shows, and more importantly, what it doesn't show. And what it doesn't show is which of these are true. The author spotted the four average faces for the classes male, female, and gay and heterosexual in their data set. Here are the four options. And it's a peculiar property of data sets of aligned faces that the mean is often quite a realistic face in itself. So here we see the means of these four subclasses and the difference between them show in some sense what is what are the typical differences between the four. So consider this plot together with the hypotheses on the previous slide. What differences do you see? Pay particular attention here to the differences in skin tone, grooming, like facial hair, body weight, 
and to the presence of glasses. I'll leave it to you to decide which you think is the more likely explanation for these differences. Choice of grooming, choice of presentation, social class, or sexuality. To eliminate some of these questions, the authors repeated their experiments by classifying purely on facial landmarks. The idea here is that we can detect landmarks very accurately, and classifying on these alone removes a lot of sources for potential clever Hans effects. We see that all subsets of the face landmarks allow for some predictive performance, but there is a clear difference between them. Note that just because we are isolating landmarks, it doesn't mean we are focusing purely on biological causes. As we saw earlier, the shape of the mouth is determined more by expression than by facial features, and the roundness of the jaw is partly determined by body weight, which is correlated with social class. For now, let's assume that the shape of the nose is mostly unaffected by grooming and facial expression. I have no idea what this, whether this assumption is valid, but let's say that it is. Focusing purely on the shape of the nose, we see that the performance drops to 0.65 AUC for men and 0.56 AUC for women. This is a lot less than the 90% AUC reported for the pixel-based classifier, but it's still well above chance level. Can we therefore say that homosexuality can be detected based on the shape of the nose? Can we conclude a biological relation based on this correlation? To interpret numbers like these, it's good to get some points of reference. We noted earlier that the fact that women live longer than men on average means that in some sense we can predict gender from age. So let's imagine that we are trying to guess somebody's gender or sex, and the guesses here will be so crude that the distinction between sex and gender doesn't matter much, and we know nothing about them except one feature. And we'll start with their age. If we look at the Dutch census data, we see that doing this will give us a 51% accuracy and a 52% AUC. This is almost chance level, but slightly higher. If we limit ourselves to older people, we see that our performance increases. And we can get an AUC as high as the sexuality classifier got based purely on noses in the female part of the data. And this can help us interpret the AUC that the authors achieved. Note that we achieve this accuracy by calling everybody female. And the AUC is achieved by guessing that in a pair consisting of one woman and one man, the older is always the woman. So think about that. If you walk into a care home blindfolded and simply call everybody female, can you really claim to be detecting their gender? To get a sense for what higher AUC and accuracy values mean, we can switch to the Ansur 2 data that is used also in the first lecture. And we see that in this population, uh, a sample of soldiers the age is a little bit more predictive. We get an accuracy of 0.65 and an AUC of nearly 60%. If we look at their waist circumference, we get an AUC that is higher than that reported by the authors of the sexuality classifier based on the nose shape. And if we look at one of the most informative features in the Ansur data set, the height, we see that we get an AUC as high as the authors reported for their best performing classifier. Here are the distributions of the heights divided by gender, and we can see a big discrepancy, but we can also see how big the area of overlap is. And this is always what we should imagine when people say that property A is predictive for property B. Just because there's some difference between the populations doesn't mean that there are no short men or no tall women. And most importantly, it doesn't mean that being short makes you in some way more feminine, or being tall makes you in some way more masculine. So when can you claim to be detecting something? The authors compare their classifiers to medical diagnostic tools to provide an interpretation of the AUC scores for the reader. And here we must make a clear distinction between what a classifier like this does and what a diagnostic test does. A test like that for breast cancer looks explicitly only at one particular source of information, in this case, the mammogram. The clinician will likely take the result of this test and factor in contextual clues, like age and lifestyle, if the test is unclear. The test can be said to detect something because it is strictly confined in the things it is allowed to look at. The clinician, in turn, is predicting or guessing something based on different factors, one of which is the test. The diagnosis of Parkinson's disease mentioned here is similar to the way this classifier works. There is no unambiguous diagnostic tool like a blood test, 
So the diagnostician needs to look at contextual clues like medical history, age, and risk factors, and is therefore engaged more in predicting or guessing than in detecting. There is still a difference, however, in what this classifier does and what a clinician diagnosing Parkinson does, in that when it comes to a clinician, the features are made more explicit. The pixel-based sexuality classifier may be inferring social class from the image, but it's not telling us that it's doing this. A doctor may be guilty of such subconscious inferences as well, but we can expect a greater level of interpretability from them. So, in the end, it's natural to ask whether this research project was a mistake. In short, were the authors wrong to do this, and if so, in what way? This is a question of values rather than science, so it's up to you to decide. I'll just note some important points to consider. Firstly, the authors weren't looking to prove this point one way or another, and initially stumbled onto this result. Given that a result has been established, it's often most unethical not to report it, so long as that reporting is done carefully and responsibly, of course. The stated aim of the authors is not to make any claim about causal mechanisms. The authors are less interested in whether the classifier picks up on grooming choices or biological features than in whether the guess can be made with some success at all. That is, because regardless of how the classifier works exactly, it shows us that in some situations, putting a profile picture online can leak sensitive data about you that you didn't know you were exposing. And as we saw in the previous social impact video, there are many countries in the world where homosexuality is illegal, and this can therefore be a valuable warning. What we may blame the authors for is poor framing. The use of the word detecting is subject to misinterpretation. To be fair, that's something I personally only became aware of when looking into this matter, so I'm not sure I can be very judgmental in that respect. Another odd thing is that in both the paper and the explanatory notes, prenatal hormone theory is often mentioned. I would say that the experiments shown here provide no evidence for one causal hypothesis over another, so it would probably have been pr more prudent to make no claims or mention of any causal effect whatsoever. So what should we remember when we frame our own research? It's important to consider which features you're using and what they tell you about the thing you're predicting. It's important to always consider multiple hypotheses for any effect you've observed. And in these cases, these can be social, biological, or personal in nature. And in general, I would recommend that you train yourself always to come up with different explanations for a given set of facts. This is a key skill for any scientist and one that requires a little bit of creativity and practice. And finally, it's important to distinguish between detecting, predicting, and guessing. I would say that even 91% AUC is more guessing than predicting, and that it's only detecting if you strictly control which features you're using. I'm indebted to several people on Twitter for helping me see the different angles on this topic, and in particular to Yasmin Bustings and Anne Ogborn. In the next video, We'll return to the matter of quantitative evaluation of your models, and we'll ask the question of what kind of statistical testing you should do, if any.